we uh, discussed uh, last time the very end stage of a medium mass star like our sun. Uh, basically, at some point, uh, all of the helium in the core is fused into carbon and some oxygen, oxygen nuclei. The star is not massive enough to compress the carbon core any further and heat it up. So no uh, energy is being produced in the core. Uh, the thermal pressure and radiation pressure push out the top layers of the star, which form planetary nebula. And in the center, there is that dead, uh, non-fusing uh, carbon plus oxygen core, uh, white dwarf. And it's supported against, because white dwarfs have very large uh, density, uh, they also have a tremendous gravitational force. Their density is about 1,000 kilograms per centimeter cube. So what is preventing the gravitational collapse of uh, white dwarf are degenerate electrons. Uh, they are in a special state because they are so densely packed that they resist being uh, squeezed any further and it's that degeneracy pressure that is supporting the star. Well, white dwarfs are also involved in uh, probably the most powerful explosions uh, that exist in the universe, so-called type 1a supernovae. Uh, basically, what is involved is that uh, uh, there is a binary system. Those of you who took astronomy 1P01 will recall that over 50% of all stars are members of a multiple star system where uh, at least two stars, binaries, uh, where the two stars are bound to each other by the force of gravity, right? So we might have a binary system uh, where one of the two stars is medium-sized star, like our sun, and eventually it expires and forms the white dwarf. And the other is still a normal star or maybe red giant, right? So what happens is that because of its high density, the force of gravity near the white dwarf is enormous, and it sucks the material uh, from its companion stars, right? All the stellar wind particles and everything else is pushed on uh, uh, the white dwarf, so its mass grows. But we've learned that uh, a white dwarf cannot have arbitrarily high mass. Uh, there is something called Chandrasekhar limit that limits the maximum mass that the white dwarf uh, can have, and it's uh, 1.4 solar masses. But it's stealing more material, right? So its mass grows, and because it's degenerate, it's supported by degenerate electrons, as the mass grows, uh, the radius shrinks. So it's compressed more and more. As it is compressed, it heats up. And then new fusion reactions start. They are actually runaway fusion reactions. And so much energy is released in the process that the whole system is uh, disrupted in type 1a supernovae. So what I've linked here under the study aids, among other things, is this uh, link here uh, that uh, is an animation of what happens in uh, uh, type 1a uh, supernova. So let's take a look. OK, so here is white dwarf sucking the material off its uh, either red giant or normal companion. Its mass grows and kaboom. Uh, they are extremely luminous. They release a tremendous amount of energy. And actually, it turns out that because of their unique mechanism, we know exactly how much explosive was there, uh, about 1.4 solar masses. We know how much energy is going um, uh, to be produced. And we can see them because of their high luminosity at very great distances. We know how luminous they are. And then using that basic relation in astronomy between observed brightness here, the intrinsic brightness or luminosity and the distance, we can find out the distance to those. And that's how astronomers find the distances to the most distant galaxies using type 1a uh, supernovae.
So let me write down a few things. And here we have its companion star. The white dwarf is uh, sucking up the material of the uh, um, companion star. And the mass of the white dwarf increases. Remember, it's a degenerate object, so as the mass grows, it, uh, its size shrinks, it compresses and heats up. Okay? As, and it turns out when its mass gets to be close to Chandrasekhar limit, the actual value uh, uh, is uh, uh, for that ignition uh, is 1.38 solar masses. Uh, it's so hot that the, there are runaway fusion reactions. Right? Although initially um, uh, the white dwarf uh, didn't have enough mass to contract so that the carbon can start fusing into heavier elements, this additional material that is dumped from its companion onto the star uh, increases the mass, it's compressed, it heats up, and the temperature gets to be so high near this threshold, uh, this, which is just below the Chandrasekhar limit, uh, that there are runaway uh, fusion reactions. And so much energy is released that uh, 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 the entire system is disrupted. There are other types of supernova. We will discuss just another type, uh, so-called type two supernova, which results from a uh, explosion of a very massive star near the end of its life. Uh, there's a spectrum in between, but these are the two uh, most important types and we'll uh, discuss them. But the important feature of type 1 uh, A supernovae is that when you look at their spectra, and they are visible, they emit light and other radiation for a period maybe of a few months, okay? Uh, uh, when you look at their spectrum, there are no hydrogen spectral lines because all of the hydrogen got used up in these runaway fusion reactions. So that's a hallmark of a type 1A supernova that they have no hydrogen spectral lines in their spectra. Okay, and because they are very bright, they are easy to see at very large distances. Moreover, they all have the same mechanism and we know how much explos explosive there is. Uh, it's about Chandrasekhar limit, Chandrasekhar mass. So we know and we can determine their luminosity uh, uh, based on the observations for nearby ones. And then we know how much luminosity the more uh, distant ones have. So again, this fundamental uh, relation uh, that is used over and over in astronomy between brightness that we measure, then we measure L for nearby type 1A supernova using this same relation where we know the distance uh, uh, from some other uh, technique, right? And then we measure uh, brightness. We know how intrinsically bright they are. We know their luminosity. And then we deduce their distance. Okay, and uh, this method is used to find the distances to the most distant galaxies in the universe. And using this, this method over the last 10 years or so, astronomers have uh, found something very peculiar about our universe. We know, as we will discuss later on, that the universe is expanding. Okay, you can visualize that as uh, expanding surface of an inflating balloon, where the surface, the two-dimensional surface, is now the universe. We don't think that there is up and down. I'm just using that as an example that, so that you can visualize the expansion of the universe. So we knew that for a while, uh, ever since 1929 or so. And we'll discuss that in detail later on. But what astronomers found is that actually the expansion is accelerating that the rate at which the universe uh, is expanding has started to accelerate over the last 4.5 to 5 billion years. And the universe is, it's estimated, about 14 
billion years old, right? So all of a sudden, for some reason, that expansion uh, has uh, uh, accelerated. And uh, astronomers, astrophysicists, in order to account for that, introduced the concept of dark energy that, in fact, constitutes the majority of the mass in the universe. About 70% uh, is that dark energy uh, 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 then a quarter is uh, uh, dark matter that we also talk about and only about 4% of all the matter in the universe is ordinary stuff that the stars and us are made of okay and we don't understand the remaining 96% uh, of the universe. We have some hints as to what it could be, but we really don't at this point in time. Okay? So think about how much we really don't know about the universe. 